Armored elements of the British Second Army advance on Thielberg, pivotal city of the German retreat from the southern Netherlands. The advance slows down at a Nazi demolished bridge spanning the Wilhelmina Canal. Crossing the canal via the twisted girders. After clearing the area of snipers, the rest of the battalion crosses the canal in assault boats. A bridgehead is secured and shortly thereafter the former Nazi stronghold is neutralized. On the western flank of the Netherlands front, the Anglo-Canadian offensive to open Antwerp is expedited by amphibious operations. First of these is the crossing of the Skelt estuary from the mainland. Objective to contact the 2nd Canadian Division fighting along a peninsula toward the islands in the estuary. Alligators reach the southeastern coast of Zuit Bevelant, garrisoned by 2,500 Nazis. Later, other armored vehicles arrive, pushing westward to the causeway linking Zuit Bevelant with the farthest of the Skelt group, Walcheren Island. Waterlogged Walcheren Island, last German strong point commanding the approaches to the important port of Antwerp. Half of the island is underwater as a result of RAF bombing of the sea walls. But five small areas garrisoned by some 7,000 fanatical Nazis pose a problem whose solution is finally found in a large-scale seaborne attack. On 1st November, a British armada of 200 ships bears down on Walcheren's western shore. counter-battery fire. Preparing for the landing at West Capella, site of the main Nazi coastal batteries commanding the entrance to the Skelt estuary. A foothold is secured, but at great cost in ships and men. Artillery on the mainland paved the way for another landing on Walcheren. British commandos prepare to embark. Objective, Flushing, Holland's third port on the southern side of Walcheren. Meanwhile, several small craft set out to lay a smoke screen for the amphibious operation. Nazi coastal guns from flushing fire on the smoke laying craft. British Army commandos land at 0945 hours, meeting less opposition than Marine commandos in the West Capella assault. Fighting ceases after fierce house to house action ending the last phase of the battle for the port of Antwerp. Prelude to the Battle of the Reich. Captured with 2,500 Germans, Lieutenant General Willem Dazer insisted on waiting until dawn for a formal surrender. Outnumbered 10 to 1, the small company of British captors agreed to the erratic commander's whim. Velocity calibration test for captured 155 shells is prepared near Corneli Munster, Germany on 3rd November. Servicing 1st Army artillery, an ordnance department team installs photoelectric cell units, 
100 and 200 feet from the muzzle of an M12 belonging to a field artillery battalion. After firing tables have been computed, thousands of seized rounds of 155 projectiles will be ready for accurate use against the Nazis. Fuse, streamlining cone, and 10-inch firing pin are all part of the German assembly. Our 155 millimeter gun with GPF tube can use this projectile as well as our own. Made in USA on the right. The other is from German dumps in France and Belgium. When discharged, the shell will intercept skylight over both photoelectric cells aligned with a gun barrel. The interval thus created is transmitted to a time measuring and recording device. The counter chronograph is accurate to one one hundred thousandth of a second. Velocity is distance between cells divided by time. A German industry is utilized for the supply needs of the First Army as men of a combat engineer battalion take over operation of a sawmill at Breinig near the Belgian frontier. A large stockpile of logs found in the mill's yard is converted into timbers and planks for bridges, temporary buildings, and other military uses. Nearby forests will provide additional logs as required. Eighteen civilian workers who had been investigated thoroughly by the Allied military government were assigned to help the engineer detail at the sawmill. They are paid eight Belgian francs per hour and receive a hot lunch. Production has been organized so that the mill can now turn out 15,000 board feet of lumber daily. Packaging medical supplies at Eloa, southeast of Apenal, on 27th October. They are to be fired in projectile containers to 7th Army infantrymen holding out since the 23rd behind German lines in the Vosges foothills. Medics wrap blood plasma units, sulfur drugs, and other first aid items. They'll be inserted in 105 and 155 millimeter shells, altered for this purpose by members of an ordnance company. Two days later at a field artillery emplacement. D rations and halazone tablets are packaged for transmittal to the trapped battalion who are using bazookas and hand grenades to hold off the Germans. The infantrymen report by radio that they prefer food to medical supplies. Both are fired into them by artillery shells and parachuted from thunderbolts of the 9th Air Force. Time fuse and light charge will open the shell at the target. Two hundred and seventy infantrymen of the trapped battalion returned to 7th Army lines on 31st October. On the 25th, after the Germans had cut in behind them and killed several of the battalion staff, these men had tried to fight their way out. Mines and machine guns forced them to drop back to dug-in positions. To reach them, a relief party fought its way through the encirclement. The surrounded doughboys had beaten off numerous attacks, but the Germans apparently hadn't realized the desperate plight of the Americans. They didn't launch a determined assault until the last day, just before the rescuers broke through. First Lieutenant Martin J. Higgins, on whom command devolved, praised the discipline of the men who went hungry for five days. He's reported as saying, when the first food landed, we sent word around to assemble everything in one place. Not a single man, hungry as they were, snatched a bit to eat until all was assembled. At 
at Stolberg, Germany on 31st October, the tracks are modified on Sherman tanks of an armored division. On the left, a new track connector which extends the width of each track by four inches. It replaces the narrower one in joining the rubber tread. The new connector is so designed that no damage will be done if the wide shoe section is knocked off while the tank is in motion. The larger bite will give better traction through snow and mud as bad weather settles over the First Army front. Montville sur Belvite, Belgium, on the First Army front. A light tank patrol of a reconnaissance squadron has found a log barrier blocking entry into the town on 1st November. Engineers have been called on to demolish the roadblock. It's necessary to blow the two sections of the barrier separately. Anti-tank mines are detonated by the charge. A winch is used to snake loose logs out of the block before the second section is blown. Again, German mines in the road lend their force to the explosion. The reconnaissance patrol goes through. M29C light cargo carrier nicknamed the Weasel. Here on Bougainville, it tows a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. The Weasel has done general duty in terrain ordinarily impassable to other vehicles, negotiating sand dunes, swamps, marshes, deep mud, and waterways. designed as a cargo carrier, here on Leyte it is also used to carry personnel and medical supplies, proving extremely valuable in evacuating wounded. Its capacity is 1,200 pounds. Power is supplied by a liquid-cooled six-cylinder engine, similar to that of the average car. Gasoline-driven, it can do 175 miles of normal land driving on a fuel tank of 35 gallons, or 14 hours of deep water operation. Palaliu Island airstrip, which was rapidly put into shape by Seabees following its capture D plus one. Best in the Palau archipelago, the field was used for strikes against Pacific bases even while last cleanups were in progress. Marine Corps films show one final phase of the Palaliu campaign. The Leatherneck cameraman shoots from a position overlooking the caves and steep ravines of the Mount Uma Brogel sector. and Marine infantrymen hold precarious positions in the valley. Above them, the Jap waits in Gibraltar-like caves, ingeniously hidden, with an interlocking system arranged to give crossfire on all approaches. Nicknames applied to the points of resistance by men of the 1st Marine Division include Horseshoe Hill and Prostitute Ridge. During the yard-by-yard -yard battle, the Leathernecks are often driven back by sniper fire. Delayed action bombs help to neutralize prepared positions above our troops. Corsairs of the 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing operating from a nearby airfield attack Bloody Nose Ridge.
rapidly being closed on fiercely resisting Japs. As infantrymen retire to replenish ammo supplies, the attack is picked up by flame-throwing Amtraks. Their fire is directed at machine gun nests, which are pinning down forward units attempting to scale the rugged hills. to aid the troops in the valley, a marine artillery piece on a nearby ridge is adjusted to fire down the hillside and point blank into Jap cave positions. on Peleliu, the 1st Marine Division suffered upwards of 5,000 casualties. Wounded are rescued under fire. Troops also are being harassed by heavy caliber mortar fire from the Gay Cebus Island, about half a mile from Palaliu. This opposition is wiped out by an invading force. A naval and air bombardment precedes the landings. Both carrier and land-based aircraft pound the little island located inside the lagoon just north of Palaliu. Armored Amtraks await the order to make the crossing. September. The Gaysibus is the site of a 3,000 foot airstrip which is believed to be operational. Invaders encounter only light and scattered opposition. crew gets ready for action. A few 
Japs change their minds about putting up a suicidal fight and come down to surrender. By mid-October, less than 300 prisoners had been taken in the Palau's, as compared with more than 12,000 killed. Prodded by one of our troops, a Jap goes up to a cave to request the surrender of his entrenched countrymen. Demolition crew takes cover after placing a charge on a pillbox. By nightfall, Nagasebu ceases to exist as a point of opposition in the Palau's. Mm -hmm. 